Welcome back. It's the Price of Creation by Lance Conrad, Chapter 2. I can imagine no greater heroism than motherhood. Musings of the Historian. When Auric came out to wake me for breakfast, he had lines creasing his face and dark bags under his eyes. It didn't seem like he had slept much. His smile was as broad as ever as he greeted me. Obviously an early riser, Amar. Good for you. However, you still haven't beat Luria. Breakfast is ready and on the table, so you better come in quickly. The breakfast was simple, a far cry from the great cooking that I had eaten the night before, mostly cheese and bread. Luria was nowhere to be seen. Ark was clearly distracted by something. On the one hand, I was glad that he wasn't asking me more questions about my past, but on the other hand, I wondered if his distraction had anything to do with Luria. When I asked about her, Auric shrugged his massive shoulders. She had some errands to run. She said that she would see you later, though. Go ahead and eat up. After countless years of talking with people, it wasn't hard to tell when someone wasn't telling me the whole truth. Beyond that, Auric was a horrible liar. I wondered if Luria was all right. Tell me, Auric, when is Luria expected to have her baby? I tested her. It was a shot in the dark, but it hit dead center. Arik smiled through bloodshot eyes. You were a sly one. She is going to have it very soon. In fact, she may be having it right now. I only tell you this because you are my guest. But it is considered bad luck in our culture to speak of such things as they are happening. Arik paused and smiled again. In fact, the men are pretty much forbidden to interfere at all, or even take notice. He paused, lowering his voice and leaning in closer, as if sharing a secret. Between you and me, I think it is one of the dumbest superstitions we have. How am I supposed to not worry about my wife? I opened my mouth to speak, but he answered his own question before I could get anything out, slamming his hand down on the table with a thundering clap. I work. That's how. Come with me. It's time to occupy my hands. You can help with the bellows. His chair almost fell over as he stood up quickly, knocking it backwards. I hurried to keep up as he walked out to his workshop in quick strides. A fire was roaring in no time, and Arik was soon pounding, almost recklessly, on a helpless piece of metal. He would pound for a while, then stick it back into the furnace as I worked the bellows, then pull it out and pound at it some more. I was fascinated to watch as he worked the metal. His fluid movements showed great experience. But the part that truly caught my eye was the stone he wore around his neck. As he worked the metal, the stone would glow with its own light from within as the glare from the furnace danced on its surface. It grew brighter as Arik made more and more specific modifications, sharpening edges and adding decorations to what now appeared to be a trowel head of some sort. I blinked to clear my eyes as I saw the stone glow even brighter when Arik worked in some intricate detail. The decoration was obviously unnecessary. It was only a simple farm tool. But Arik worked at it with a burning intensity. He apparently didn't have a complex job to do that day, so he would make a complex job out of a simple one. I wondered more and more about the stone around Arik's neck as it continued to throb and glow brighter as the metal was shaped under Arik's expert hand. This would explain the great workmanship that I had seen along the wall and in the town. If Arik could create this sort of workmanship with his stone, Certainly there were others equally as skilled in working wood, stone, or anything else. I yelled over the clanging in the furnace to Arik. Does the color of your stone determine your expertise? Arik looked confused for a moment, then nodded, sweat dripping from his forehead, still focused on adding needless decoration to the trowel. The blues have always been metal workers. That is our gift from the stones. Others have different gifts. Arik spoke without breaking from his task his steady strokes falling in rhythm. The hammer was like an extension of his forearm, the power flowing smoothly from his shoulders down his arm through the hammer and into the metal. Greens, for instance, have always had a special gift over plants, trees, and other such living things. You may have noticed Luria's stone. I nodded. Light blue. Light blues have always been the stone cutters and shapers. I make enough with my shop so that she does not have to work. But most of the plates and other dishes in our home were made by her. The pride in his voice was obvious, and for good reason. I had noticed the plates the night before and at breakfast. At first I had thought that they had brought out special dishes in my honor, 
but a quick glance around the house showed that every other dish displayed the same intricacy in its design. What about the red stones? I asked. I noticed that the man who wanted me dead wore one. Arik nodded grimly and pounded a bit harder at the glowing metal. Yes, said Han. He is a cruel man. As near as we can tell, the red stones give their owner special skills with fire. Unfortunately, there is no great craft in fires, so they spend most of their time as merchants. Some, like Sadhan, set themselves up as leaders over the people. He owns a shop in town, but he doesn't spend much time there. How does he make his money, then? I asked. Well, there's a tax that's collected from all of the people. It was originally Sadhan's idea. The wall kept the destroyers away for a very long time, but when they started finding ways to get over the wall, he insisted that we needed to post lookouts and guards. Our spat. Guards. Fat lot of good they do. They are supported by our money, but they are widespread and lazy. You notice that we knew nothing of your coming until you were practically walking down our street. I nodded. I had seen no guards, and I had walked for a long time. So, Ara continued, Sadhan has declared himself captain of the guards and guardian of our safety. Contempt dripped from every syllable as Arik spoke about the man. Near as I can tell, all that he does is take long walks, patrols, he calls them, and gets fat off the money he takes from... Arik's head suddenly shot up, his hands trembling. He dropped both his hammer and the piece he was working on and tore out of the workshop. I ran after him. In a few moments, I also heard what he had been listening for. Cheering.